My name is Blake Ellis. I'm the Associate Vice President for Research. Um, and the research office, in conjunction with the, the data specialists at the library, have organized mostly them in Data Palooza. Um, <laughs> um, so we hope you'll have a good experience. We hope you'll learn something. Kind of the, the goal of this was to provide some broad coverage of a lot of topics because a lot of you, first of all, congratulations on being researchers and having the opportunity to discover new things. Um, but the way that you're approaching your research and the type of research you do will, will vary significantly based on your interests and your department and so on. So we're going to cover a lot of different things today um, and hopefully give you some resources that if some of the stuff is of particular interest to you, you'll, you'll have the ability to go learn more, uh, contact the speakers, the presenters. Um, one thing I guess is just a small philosophical comment. Um, when I was a student, it's been a while, but it seemed like the goal was always to just get done, get to graduation. And I'm always looking at trying to get to whatever was next and not necessarily enjoying what it was I was doing at the moment sufficiently. And research is kind of that way. You know, your goal is to get a degree. Your goal is to get a job. But a good opportunity to learn how to think critically Good opportunity to learn how to manage data, how to write papers, how to communicate, and how to discover stuff, be observant, observational about things. So make sure you make the most of your research opportunity. And we hope that by giving you some tips today on, on data management, um, we can help you be a little more efficient as you enjoy that process. So <clears throat> what we're going to do today is we have three different sessions. First session is Don't Become a Data Horror Story, Best Practices, Tips, and Tricks. We have two presenters. We have Jessica Shaw, who's an assistant professor in sociology. She'll be our first. And we have Tyson Barrett, who's a research assistant professor of psychology, and I believe managing director of the Data Science and Discovery Unit. Um, <clears throat> so they'll each take 20 minutes, and then we're going to have a 20-minute question and answer period. We'll have a short break. And then session two is going to be uh, doing it right, doing do it right from the start, ensuring reproducibility and confirmation. And we'll have some speakers all introduced then. Um, and then we'll end up with some kind of a fun data data game, that sort of thing. So we're scheduled to go from, from one to five. But we'll have some breaks in between and hopefully a chance to network a little bit and interact. So any questions before we start? Thank you for being here. And um, <clears throat> Jessica, go ahead. All right. Can you hear me? Oh, Mike? let me just say one more thing because I want to. Um, we have a, Betty, can you help us get to the, the box, the file in, in the box folder that has all the takeaways and stuff? Do we have that on a slide already? We don't have it on a slide, but we will post it on the Research Data Management website. We have a page for Datapalooza, and then we'll link resources to that page. And when we send you the survey, which all of you will gladly complete and give us information about <laughs> later, uh, there will be information about that there, too. So uh, we'll have lots of resources for you to take home with this so that you can remember where you go for more help. I'm, I'm Betty. I'm, I'm your data librarian. Every one of your personal data librarians. You can call me anytime between 8 and 5. I go to bed by 9 and I want to answer you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, We tried to set this up to be successful for you uh, as an audience. So we could just wander all over talking about data. But we've asked the presenters to come up with like three takeaway messages. And in that box folder, each presenter has a short summary of their takeaways. So you know, pay attention and, and, and see if you can figure out what those takeaways are. They should be obvious. But if you don't get all the notes down, there should be stuff available. Go to the website. So. Hear me in the mic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Jessica Shad, as um, was already announced, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about um, doing effective surveys. So, a lot of what I'm going to be focused on today is more on the data collection aspect. And in doing so, I hope that when you get to the point of analyzing or cleaning or presenting your data, you have better data to work with. And so surveys are one of the most common ways that 
social scientists at least gather data. And I know that other um, people in other disciplines use it as well. Um, and while I was getting ready today, I thought of three things that I didn't include in my slides that you don't want to do with survey research. And so I'm going to start by telling you those three things. So first of all, you don't want to make any assertions with your data um, that are not accurate. And that's for, I'll be talking a little bit about sampling and measurement. Um, and so that's one thing that you really want to move away from, um, if at all possible. You also don't want to gather any data that's not useful for you in your analysis or for other people who might be interested in your data. And then also, you want to be really careful about keeping the confidentiality of the people who participate in your research. So all three of those are, are sort of the things with surveys that you want to be most careful in terms of not becoming um, a data horror story, I guess I would say. Um, and I do have quite a bit of experience doing research. So I'm a natural resource social scientist. And so a lot of my research is focused on getting information, usually from doing surveys from farmers about how they make decisions to use conservation practices. I also do a lot of research in rural communities on quality of life. And so I've done a lot of mail surveys, but also some telephone surveys, and then even drop-off pickups, which I'll talk about later on. Um, so to get started, first of all, what are surveys? It does seem like sometimes there's a little bit of confusion of what surveys actually are. And sometimes the word survey is even used by politicians or marketers to gather data that's not really the type of data that we as researchers use. Um, but when I'm referring to surveys, I'm talking about collecting information from a sample of individuals and using their responses to standardize questions. So a key thing there is that you're asking people questions that are worded in the exact same way so that you can draw comparisons by different groups in your sample. And a lot of times these are close-ended questions, right? That makes a lot, it a lot easier to compare the responses if there's only a select number of ways that people can answer whatever question it is that you're answering them. Some surveys do include open-ended questions, but it's a little bit more time consuming and challenging to draw comparisons then. So a lot of survey research focuses mostly on closed-ended questions. So uh, case in point, this is a, a set of survey questions that I used when I was looking at people's perceptions of crime up in the Bakken area of North Dakota and Montana to see how that recent boom had impacted their daily lives. So you can see that I'm asking people um, to what degree they attribute the following problems to the recent oil and gas boom um, in their community. And so they select uh, one response. This is very different than asking an open-ended question and letting them tell me um, all the things that maybe they've experienced since the recent boom. It's easier for me to, for me to compare. Um, and there's really three main advantages to collecting um, surveys or collecting data through surveys. So first of all, it's a very versatile method. You can focus on a lot of different topics. You can use a lot of different ways to gather your data. So you can contact people via, via phone, online, via mail, and ask them to respond in those different ways as well. Um, it's also a very efficient way of gathering data, particularly if you use online surveys. So you can gather data quite quickly and for relatively cheaply using survey methodology. And that, of course, varies by um, what sort of mode you use to collect your data. And then finally, usually, but not always, um, your results are generalizable. So what you find from just a sample of the group that you might be studying is hopefully able to tell you about that group as a whole. That, of course, depends, and this is really, really important, on how you do your sampling. If you use a convenient sample to gather survey data, you're not going to have very generalizable data. If I stand outside of the library and ask students about their study habits, I'm going to have a very biased sample, right? That would be a convenient sample. I'm not giving every single student at USU the chance to tell me about their survey habits. Um, so. The, the degree of generalizability depends a lot on how you do your sampling or how you get people to participate in your survey. Um, the key issue in survey research today that I'd say most of the experts are most concerned about is that response rates are down. So if I contact 100 people 
it used to be that a pretty good response rate would be that I could get 70 to 80 of those people to respond to my survey. Does anybody have any idea of what response rates look like today? Yeah, 30%. Yeah, I'd say 30% is what I've been getting when I've been doing surveys with farmers, and that's sort of generally what a, what a lot of people are experiencing. Again, it, it varies by what mode, so how you're contacting people and how you're doing your sampling and how, um, how, much, how many resources you have to contacting people. Um, but, but people are quite concerned with response rates going down. Um, in a recent study by Stedman et al., they found that um, in the, the surveys that had been conducted in their lab at Cornell University over the last 30 or so years, that with each year, the response rate had gone, do gone down on average about 1%. So it's not that big of a deal just one year to the next, but when you look at over a 30 year period, that can be quite substantial. Um, so here is their, their plot of the response rates over time. And you can see that if you look in the 1970s, they were hovering anywhere between 55 up to 90%. And now if you look down to today, um, it's closer to the 30 to 50% range. So a big decline over time. And the big problem with this is that it can hurt the representativeness of your findings. So if you only have certain types of people responding to your survey, those people might be different from your non-respondents. So if you're trying to say something about a population um, as a whole and only certain type of people are responding, that can be problematic. And so increasingly we're needing to do non-respondent tests. So basically you need to keep trying to contact those non-respondents and see if you can figure out why they didn't take your survey and how they're different from the people who responded. Or sometimes we can also um, use sec uh, secondary data, so maybe the census data or the egg census data, and compare our respondents to that population and then adjust our data um, in that way. But um, it can hurt the, the representativeness if we don't have a very high response rate. Um, and so response rates are declining. People have different explanations for it. Um, does anybody want to throw one out there of why they think responses to surveys are going down? Because you've sent too many. What's that? Because they've, we've been sent too many. Yes, yes. Burden. Not just by academic researchers, right? Who else is getting surveys from? Where else are you getting them from? Corporate world. Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, so like there's customer surveys. Um, right now, I'm getting a lot of political surveys, and they're really not looking for valid data from me. They're more looking to get my email address or verify a position that they already, to, to help verify their stance on a particular issue. Um, and so uh, overburden is a, is a big thing. Also, it's become increasingly easy for people to isolate themselves from um, researchers who are conducting surveys, right? So if you get a phone call on your smartphone from a number that you don't know, what do you do? <laughs> right, you, you don't answer it. And even they, they've tried um, switching to numbers that might mean something to you, and now you already know that you also don't answer those. It used to be, though, if you had a landline at your house, which a lot of people don't have anymore, you would pick it up because you wanted to know who called. And the... The landscape for doing this sort of research has, has changed tremendously. And so um, right now, survey researchers are sort of scrambling to try and figure out what's the best new method for doing survey research, um, given uh, some of these, these issues. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, gathering v valid, so that's accurate survey data, reliable, um, and generalizable data. And so I'll talk a little bit about that through planning, collecting, and then presenting your data. And there's a, a picture of some of my grad students last year doing a massive mailing of uh, mail surveys to farmers in South Dakota. We sent out a total of 6,000 surveys across the state. And so a lot of work goes into and resources go into doing um, survey research. So it's very important to do the planning ahead of time. Um, so first of all, you want to plan exactly how you're going to use your survey data before you collect it. This sounds obvious, but even myself as, as having done a number of surveys, I always, always say this 
I wish I would have added a question about dot, 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 or I wish I would have asked the question this way instead of how I asked it. And so by putting the thought in before you're getting to the data analysis and data cleaning stage, you can really save yourself from having to um, go through this horror story of your own, wishing that you had different data. Um, so you wanna ask yourself, what kind of analysis do I plan to do with the data once I get it? What kind of variables are my independent variables or my dependent variables? So if you wanna look at age differences, you better make sure that you have an age question on your survey. You can't go back and add that in later on. What you collect in a survey is what you collect. So some of you might do qualitative type research where after you start doing a couple of interviews, you might say, I'm gonna start asking these questions as your project evolves. You can't do that with survey research. What you send out are the response, are, is the data that you're going to get. So you can't change it retroactively. Um, so here's an example of my own small horror story. Um, but from that same survey in North Dakota and Montana, we asked a series of questions about people's perceptions of crime. As we started to do the analysis, somebody asked, do we have a question of people being victims of crime or having experienced crime? No, we didn't. And so a really good predictor, I'm not a criminologist, so I'll say it's not totally my fault, but we didn't have an indicator in our data set that would tell us whether or not an individual respondent had ever experienced crime but we're trying to understand their perceptions of crime. So by, by thinking that through a little bit more before we collected the data, we would have had a better data set to work with later on. Um, you also wanna think about what level of measurement you need for each variable. So what do I mean by that? I mean you want to make sure that um, if you're looking for a, a continuous or a numeric response, that's what you ask for. So if you're looking for um, a number, you need to make sure you ask for a number. If you're looking for a, um, a category, then ask for a category. But for example, um, this should hopefully should make it a little bit more clear. Um, I always include on my surveys, what year were you born? And so in this way, I can um, later on, I can change that into respondents who are old, however I define them as old, or young. If I were to instead have included on my survey, do you consider yourself to be a young adult, an adult, elderly? I can't go back and change that to what year somebody was born, right? So you wanna think of what sort of um, analysis do you wanna do and how am I going to ask my question um, before you go about uh, collecting your data. Um, you also wanna put yourself in the shoes of potential respondents is my other key tip for you. So questions need to make sense and be answerable. And I'll give you some examples of this in just a minute. You don't want your survey to be too long. Who has received a really long survey and quit taking it in the middle? <laughs> yeah, or decided not to take the survey at all. Um, we wanna be really um, cognizant about overburdening people that we're requesting for their time. And this can be really hard to do as researchers, right? We think we have so many great ideas of all the things that we want to ask about. Um, and so planning ahead of time and reducing the number can be really important to boosting up that response rate. Timing is really important. So I do a lot of research with farmers. And when might I want to avoid sending surveys to farmers? Spring, yes. And, and fall harvest, yes. If I send my surveys during those time periods, I'm not going to get very many respondents. And in fact, I had a bit of bad luck this summer. Um, I sent out a survey and it's a little bit hard to read, but there was massive flooding that happened in South Dakota. So um, even though I had sort of tried to plan around when planting was normally done, because of uh, External circumstances, um, a lot of farmers were still trying to get out on their fields and unable to take the survey. And so I definitely noticed that in my response rate. Um, you know, don't send out surveys over Christmas, those sort of things. Um, you also wanna make sure that your topic, whatever um, you're focusing on, 
has saliency or um, saliency for the people who are taking your survey, and that also can increase your response rate. So make sure that you tell the people who are potentially taking your survey how the responses might impact them. That can also um, help. Um, also, doing a, a pilot study, so getting a sample of people who are in the population to take your survey before you send it out can be really important to gathering valid data later. Um, having, if you can't do that, that does sometimes take a lot of resources and time. If you can't do that, at the very least, have experts in that field review your survey. So, um, so that you're not just sending out something that doesn't make sense to the population that you're trying to study. So a, a couple um, tips on writing good survey questions. You want to make sure that you're using short, non-academic words and sentences. So um, take a look at this question. Do you believe in anthropogenic climate change? Does everybody know what anthropogenic means? Does anybody want to tell us what it means? <laughs> Human God, yeah, but not everybody knows that, right? So make sure if you're asking people questions, they need to be able to answer it. Otherwise, they're going to skip over the question, or worse, quit taking your survey, or also not very good, answer it, and not really know what they're talking about. Um, another tip I would give you is avoid double-barreled questions. So avoid asking questions that really have two questions embedded within them. So here's an example of a double-barreled question. In your opinion, how would you rate the speed and accuracy of your work? So speed and accuracy are very different things, right? Someone can be very fast, but very inaccurate. So make sure you're not doing that. Separate them out. Um, you want to minimize bias or leading. So many people have attended the movie Gone with the Wind more than any other motion picture produced this century. Have you ever seen this movie? Is this sort of making people feel bad for not having seen Gone with the Wind? <laughs> yep, exactly. So it's going to bias your it's going to bias your response if you have a, a bias lead into your question. So just keep it simple. Um, allow for disagreement. This seems like minor, but experiments have been done showing that if you don't do what I'm going to show you, it can lead to um, people disagreeing with what you say. So. This is an example of a, a not perfect question. Do you agree that this community is a good place to live? To make this question better, you should add in, do you agree or disagree that this community is a good place to live? Um, don't ask questions they can't answer. How much money did you spend on groceries in the last year? Anybody? Anybody know? No. OK. How much did you spend in the last week? Make response categories exhaustive, so make sure that there's a response for everybody. If you're asking about families, you're sure leaving out some people by just having those. Have another option is one way to do it. Make sure that you also use response categories that are mutually exclusive. So make sure that there is not overlap unless it's a check all that apply question. So if I typically spend three hours on social media, I'm not going to know in this bad question how to respond to your survey. So make sure there's not overlap. Incentives are another nice way if you have the resources to increase response rates. Um, so social exchange theory um, shows that if we give people something ahead of time, then they feel obligated to um, participate in our survey. Um, so I often include $2 bills in my, um, in my surveys. And you can see I've gotten some notes back from people about um, them appreciating it. And I've done um, experiments to show that um, using the $2 incentive can boost my response rate significantly. So you can see no incentive, I had a 25% response rate. And with incentive, I had 32%. Finally, my last tip for you is know the limitations of your survey design. Every single research project is going to have some sort of weakness. And this includes methods using surveys. So make sure that you know what those weaknesses are. This could be because of how you designed your survey, or it could also just be because you have a lack of resources. Um, regardless, being aware of these limitations um, can help you to address or temper your findings um, when you're discussing 
for publishing your research. Um, so just thinking about it, if you're using a non-probability or a convenient sample, you need to make sure not to say that your findings are generalizable to the population. Um, and there, there's different methods that you can use, like weighting to make your, your responses more, um, more like the population that you're interested in. Um, a couple emerging ways that people are doing survey research is online panels. I'm not going to talk about these, but if you'd like to ask me more about them, I can talk about them. And then using multiple modes of contacting people and also allowing them to respond to your survey. So key takeaways right there. Um, if you're interested in learning more about survey design, I do teach a full class on this. It will be offered a year from now, um, Sociology 7100. Um, I don't know the day or time that it will be available yet, um, but feel free to, to contact me if you'd like to see the syllabus or if you're wondering how it might work with, with some research that you have coming up. So, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Tyson. Uh, I'm Tyson B. I grew up with a bunch of Tysons, so I learned to go by Tyson B. Um, so my talk, I'd, I wanted to call it uh, Finding Data Balance. Um, we're going to come back to these rocks. I, I think they're beautiful for one thing, but it's also precarious. So uh, how many are really comfortable with uh, Excel or Google Sheets? in here, like they've, they've used it sufficiently to be like, yeah, I can use that, okay. Uh, what about SPSS, Jamovi, JASP, or R SAS? Decent amount, but it's way less than the, the spreadsheet one. That's kind of what I expected. So regardless of where you come from with this, uh, almost everyone is using some form of spreadsheet software. Uh, even if you're like, man, I'm so hardcore R user, I try not to use spreadsheets, they, they come to you. They, they just, they pop up. So when you're thinking of those rocks in the corner, uh, there's a million ways to knock those rocks over, right? So you can think of some rude ways, just kicking it. Uh, there's some natural ways that wind blows and they fall over. Uh, there's only a couple ways that you actually can stack them. Um, when it comes to spreadsheets, it's the same way. There's a million ways to make your life harder. Uh, has anyone seen this in their, their great experience in research? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious. You're confronted with this situation. You come back to a project. You, you can see that, so I put data modified. You can tell I'm really in the data mood. Uh, the date modified. Um, and then the names, uh, ideas of how to handle this situation. So you come back to a project and you need to answer some questions about things. What, what, what's your natural uh, tendency to do here? Date. So look at the date modified. So here, if you scan this, this one looks like the last one that we edited. So data final, final version two. But there, there is a data final, final, final that was modified just a week earlier. So are we getting concerned maybe? The, these two, maybe there's a, maybe this one was edited on accident or someone came in and was just like moving something and then they decided not to and they saved it anyway. So the day modified changed. Uh, this is a scary situation. Um, and then like this one, <laughs> there's always like one of those, uh, someone just like wrote their name because they were doing something with it. I have no idea what's happening in data gen. Uh, there's also some issues with copying and pasting data. Uh, if you've done that before, there's issues where sometimes you 
they didn't copy all the stuff that you anticipated copying. And so you thought you brought over all the data, but really you brought over a third of the data. And uh, that can be quite shocking when it comes to the analysis. Uh, anyone use color coding uh, to help you understand your spreadsheet? Yeah, it, it, if nothing else, it makes you feel good. You look at the spreadsheet and you're like, ah, oh, colors, it's not just numbers. Uh, but the issue is, is that isn't data that you can end up using very easily. Uh, it looks pleasant, but it doesn't tell you anything. So unless you have an indicator that goes along with the color coding, it's not gonna do you any favors down the road. Uh, so Excel uh, is aggressive <laughs> when it comes to dates. Uh, has anyone put like one to three in a cell and it's like, oh, January 3rd, <laughs> that is what you mean. And you're like, no, I meant one to three. Like that is the, that's the category. <laughs> I don't know why, but Excel is just ultra aggressive like that. So you have to watch out. Um, Dates and anything that looks like a date, Excel is going to treat just like a date. Uh, so you may have a column of data that is uh, someone's response about how often they do something. And pretty quickly, what that turns into is January 3rd. And if you try to turn that back into a number, it's gonna be like 4,000 or 43,000. And you're like, <laughs> no one's, uh, go into the store 43,000 times a week. So what, what, what does that response mean? Uh, so you have to be very careful when it comes to uh, spreadsheets, what their natural behavior is. Uh, another one that uh, I come across a lot uh, is hidden columns. Um, this can be really nice to help you not feel overwhelmed with a really big data spreadsheet but it really can throw you off when you start to try to work with your data, especially, so I'm an applied statistician in the College of Education. Most of my work is helping other people deal with their, their data problems. Uh, and this one sneaks up all the time. So someone will hand me an Excel spreadsheet and they're like, there's only three columns in there. I look at it, there's only three columns. I'm like, okay, this will be easy. I try to bring it into R. R is my preferred method of uh, statistical analysis. And suddenly there's 5,000 columns. And I'm like, I don't, where did those come from? Oh yeah, there's hidden columns through the whole, the whole spreadsheet. So really quickly, hiding columns can make something that looks quite pleasant uh, into a nightmare. So I would say, no. Uh, if I haven't given you the clue, I love Michael Scott. Uh, yeah, the, there's always, uh, issues when it comes to these things. If you apply these things, you're going to have problems down the road. Uh, there's this article, Broman et al. Uh, it's a preprint. Uh, look him up. Um, he provides some uh, principles of working with data and spreadsheets. Uh, I'm going to go over just a handful of them. He gives probably 15 or so, 12 or 15 in there. First one is to be consistent. Uh, the first nightmare that you can create for yourself is changing your mind about how to handle something halfway through your, your uh, data management or collection or analysis. Uh, you can do a bunch of things wrong, but if you're consistent about it, then it's a lot easier to fix. Uh, so when you're like, I don't know what the right way to do this is, the first principle, just be consistent because then you always can at least backtrack a little bit. Another one is write dates like this. I know it's, if you're from America, you're like, that is totally unnatural. <laughs> Why would we do year, month, day, uh, even though that totally makes sense? <laughs> it's like the metric system. Uh, we just are like, we don't care. Uh, we'd rather do <laughs> month, day, year, which has never made sense to me. Um, if you write dates like this, when a date shows up in another format, then you immediately know that wasn't me, something's wrong. Uh, don't leave any cells empty. This can, this is really natural in a spreadsheet to be like, oh, it's missing, I'm just gonna leave it empty. It's actually best if you have some sort of indicator about it being missing, whether that's NA or 999 or negative 99, whatever it is, 
that helps you know that it wasn't overlooked. It wasn't an accidental deletion when you're going through the spreadsheet because sometimes stuff like that happens. You, you're trying to type something out and you're like, wait, wh where did that go? And then you don't realize that you deleted something. I uh, put just one thing in a cell. Uh, this one I don't see as often, but I still see it come up where people will try to write multiple things into a single cell because it looks nice. Uh, this is also true of cell merging. It looks really nice, but really quickly that can throw a lot of data analyses off because what column does that actually go with? So you just want to put one thing in a cell and don't combine cells. Uh, we call this rectangulating. <laughs> uh, you want to have your data in a rectangle. Uh, if you have different things copy and pasted all around it, it's going to be hard to go in and analyze that later on. It's going to be a lot more confusing. So you want to have every column is a variable and every row is an observation, whatever that means for your data. So that could, a single observation could be a school or it could be an individual, it could be a rat, uh, it could be a property, it could be uh, any of those, it could be a single plot of land. Whatever it is, a single row needs to be a single observation. Uh, has anyone created a data dictionary? Yeah, raise your hands like proudly, because that, that's, yeah. Uh, it's not practiced very much because it is a lot of extra work, but when you, come across new data, one of the first things you want to do is create a data dictionary because at some point, future you is going to come back to this. And it's going to be like, what is that? And if you don't have a data dictionary, you're going to have to do a lot of looking around. With a data dictionary, it's going to be answered right there. Uh, so a data dictionary, really, the core pieces that you need to have in there is the variable name, so that's tied to your data, so the column name, what it is, so maybe what it's trying to measure, and what the responses mean. If you have those three things in there, you're going to be able to come back to your data much more simply than if you're just coming back and you're wondering, what, what are my possible options here? I can't remember what they were. These are what people said, but I, I don't know what was presented to them. Uh, notably, uh, REDCap, it's a collection software that uh, the College of Education has provided. Uh, it creates a data dictionary for you. Um, so there, there's some benefits to looking into REDCap. Uh, it's similar to Qualtrics in a lot of ways, but REDCap will create that for you, which is nice. Time saver. Uh, another one, don't use color as data. If you have something that you want an indicator, you want these are all together. These are grouped in some way. Create a new column that tells you that. So you can say indicator of group, and you'd put ones for all those people and zeros for the others. That, that's a great approach. You can still use the color, but don't forget the indicator. And then uh, don't include calculations in raw data. Uh, these things can change abruptly when someone is unaware that these columns are reliant on these other columns. Uh, that, that's a quick way to lose a bunch of data and not know why. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna make some recommendations about how to handle that one a little bit better. But in raw data, you just don't, don't want calculations in there. The, the thing that I like to say is you want to always be kind to your future self. Uh, you may have collaborators too, and that's also important to be nice to them, of course. But at some point, future you is going to come back to this. If you're using this data to publish or you're using it to present, at some point someone's going to ask a question and you're going to be like, I can't remember, that was a while ago. I actually need to go back and look. And uh, this happens to me a lot when we uh, have one of those slower journals that you're submitting a paper to. And you start working on another project and you aren't thinking about that paper anymore. And then the revisions finally come back. They're, they're asking for some things and you're like, I can't remember what we did. So when, when you do come back, uh, it's really helpful if you've done all these things that you're going to be like, oh, 
Tyson when he was 31 years old. Thank you, <laughs> whatever. Thank you for doing that for me. Uh, and what, what these things are going to help you do is find that, that data balance. So you're not going to feel like uh, you're just waiting to kick over those rocks. You're, you're actually going to uh, come back and know that there's going to be balanced rocks here. I know it's always precarious. You can always mess up data, but they're going to be there, and I'm going to understand how to work with them. So when it comes to uh, organizing, th this is one approach. There, there's many. Uh, but this one I particularly like. So when you use spreadsheets, you want to be very particular about where spreadsheet analyses are and spreadsheet data are. Those should always be kept separate and obvious. Uh, so one, one way to do this is if this is a, a folder in your, on your computer, so your project name, whatever it is, Datapalooza. One folder in there is just going to be called data. And you're going to know if it's in there, it's just data. I am not going to do any analyses in there. It's just my data. So in there might be rawdata.csv. Um, and then maybe a clean data where you went in and you clean things up. Uh, having both of those can be really important. Uh, I always recommend that you always have a raw data file that you never change. It's always housed in your data folder and you never do anything with it. You may bring data from it, but you're never going to change data inside of it. Next one I would say is analyses. And this one, go ahead and have spreadsheet data in there. Uh, do analyses with it. Mess things up. Try stuff out. And the nice thing is, is you always can come back to your original data because it's housed nicely in your data folder. It's not housed in that spreadsheet. And if you make a mistake, suddenly it's gone. And then I always like having a manuscripts folder in there. I like keeping my analyses and manuscripts somewhat separate. Uh, manuscript ones tend to get really messy because you're going back and forth between collaborators and there's comments, there's old versions, stuff like that. So you want to keep that away from where your data actually is. And so uh, you can actually find where your data and analyses are without having to go through all the, the manuscripts. All right. With the remaining time, I just wanted to go over a few terms that can help you communicate what you want to do in a spreadsheet. Uh, from anyone uh, know Hadley Wickham? If you're in the R world, maybe you've heard of him. He, he's he's a big big deal there. But um, uh, a lot of these come from his work from SQL, uh, database management language, and uh, DeepFire. That's from Hadley. Uh, so one of the issues with data is that it's very abstract what we're doing, and there's a bunch of synonyms for the same stuff. And so when you're trying to communicate with a collaborator and you're trying to say what you did with the data or what you want them to do with the data, it can be very helpful to have a grammar that actually describes what is happening and one that's not going to be changing a whole lot over time. And uh, here's, I'm just going to give you a, a handful. Uh, to consider, um, and then you can look into uh, SQL and dplyr to, to learn more. So the first, first one I want to talk about is data wrangling. Anyone heard that term before? So it's the idea of bringing in data and cleaning it up. Uh, so cleaning and manipulating, it's all, they're all synonyms in some way. So it's about obtaining and cleaning data to get it ready for the analysis. Uh, one thing that I find with my students is when I say, cleaning data, it is kind of a stressful thing. They're like, I don't even know what that means. Uh, <laughs> how do you clean data? Uh, it's, it's all about just getting the data ready for your analysis, whatever that means. If that's recoding a variable, if that's uh, dropping columns that you don't need, those are all data cleaning, data wrangling things. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned raw data, clean data being separate files. But what if you're collecting data in the middle um, of you know stage two, stage three? You've already cleaned it and you've done that recoding and that kind of stuff. Would you put that new data back into the old file or 
with a raw data file, or do you just start adding into your clean data file with your data now that there's a better organization to it? So what, personally what I would do is I would have uh, a subfolder in my data folder that would be like first round and then second round, and then I may clean both and then combine them and have a complete data. Uh, that's scary when you have two different collections coming in, that it can, things can start to go haywire. So it's always nice to maintain both of them and then you can bring them together. Uh, another, so another term is selecting. Whenever you say the word selecting, it refers to getting columns. So each variable, so I'm selecting these columns for uh, this analysis, so that's selecting. Filtering is about grabbing the rows. So sometimes you only want to analyze certain uh, individuals, so certain groups maybe, or uh, maybe there's analysis where it's just females in your sample. Uh, that's filtering. So filtering observations means you just grab certain observations, but keeping all the, the columns. Uh, another one, mutating, uh, I like this term. It, it's either creating a new variable or an, an adjusting an, an existing one. So it's all about taking what you currently have and like recoding or uh, transforming the data in some way, like doing a log transform, that, that's a common one. So when you're changing a variable in some way or creating a brand new one, mutating it is a term for that. Uh, you also have summarizing. A uh, synonym for that one is aggregating. Uh, so that's usually taking lots of information and uh, somehow reducing it into some summary statistics in some way. Uh, common ways or means, medians, uh, anything that takes a lot of information and condenses it into uh, less information uh, is some form of summarizing or aggregating. Uh, another one is pivoting. Uh, this one has a lot of synonyms for it. There's reshaping, there's elongating, there's widening. All of these things are not about changing what's in the data, but the way that it's shaped. So often uh, we collect data in a wide format where we have observation for time one in this variable for that measure and time two for it and time three. But for some analyses, we actually need those to be shaped more like this. And so that, that's called pivoting. And then the last one I want to talk about is called tidying. Uh, that's a really broad term. It's just when you have a clean, you're cleaning your data set or you're pivoting it or rectangulating it. These are all really abstract things. But it, it, if you have time to look into these, I, I, I recommend it. Um, ultimately, our goal at the end of getting ready for an analysis with the spreadsheet is to have our data, uh, all columns or variables and all rows or observations. If you have that, then uh, the data should be ready for you to actually do analyses that, um, with a spreadsheet or with uh, other software. Um, if you are interested in, in learning more, uh, here are some, some links. Uh, I always call this the, the picture slide. So if you, if you need to remember anything here, this is always a good one to take a picture of. Um, I, I am uh, providing these slides uh, at my website uh, if you want to take a look at them. Thank you. Center uh, related to hopefully what they talked about, or whatever. Um, so you mentioned like suggestions in organizing your raw clean data and your analyses. Let's say I'm not doing like R analysis and I'm doing spreadsheet analysis. How do you keep the mutation or like formulas or how you processed it visible for future you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So spreadsheets are notorious because they don't have uh, the steps written out. So when you use a coding program, you have all that written out for you, so you can come right back to it. Uh, honestly, the, the best that I've seen for, that people have done 
is to keep a record themselves. So instead of code, they, they write down, this is the, the things that I did, just like they're writing code, uh, but still to keep those separate. So the notes that you take about uh, what you did to the data, um, that should go in the analysis folder. So it, it, it keeps you uh, organized in terms of what did I actually do with that data that, that led me to this point. So you recommended to not leave cells blank. And why was that again? Because uh, I use mostly SAS for my statistical analysis, and I always leave my cells blank because then uh, SAS can recognize as a not apply. Right. So that's a, it's a great question because most statistical analyses will recognize a blank cell as missing. The issue is if you're going to be working with your data in the spreadsheet at all, uh, a missing could be an accident or it could be meaningfully missing. And so uh, it's going to be a lot harder for you to put 999 in a cell on accident than accidentally deleting it. Does that make sense? Yeah, great question. It's more of a Jessica's question. So um, I want to know, like, maybe it's a long question, I would make it concise and clear. So if we want to collect um, survey data and um, like, is there like certain amount of participants we have to get uh, in order to um, like get the uh, like data to be used as generalized? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question, and that really goes to um, thinking about how you do the sampling and if you're using some sort of probability sampling. Um, so there's probability sampling where uh, you give everyone at least some sort of known chance of being in your research, and there's non-probability where maybe it has more to do with, with convenience or um, or you purposefully selecting some people. Um, but depending on how much heterogeneity there is in the population that you're studying, um, that can play a role in how many uh, people you need to participate in your study. Uh, but if you think about like polling right now that they're doing, political organizations are doing to try and understand how people are going to vote, um, they say that they, they can do it with approximately 1,000 people if they are um, doing a, a sampling strategy that, that's making sure they get um, a proper number of, of people fitting in certain categories. Um, so, so I guess my answer is it's, it's not set in stone. Um, it depends on how varied your population is and, and what you're trying to do with the data once you get it collected. Um, so it, in general though, with a couple thousand respondents, you can have enough data to be able to say something about most populations using probability samples. Um, but but it can vary. So yeah. you might be able to answer that better with statistics. Yeah. Would you just tell us uh, quickly what you um, what the online panels were about? Sure, sure. So it's it's really interesting. So um, I believe we have Qualtrics here at USU, correct? Mm -hmm. And so I've been contacted a couple of times by by Qualtrics. And increasingly, these different sur survey organizations, so like SurveyMonkey that you've probably heard of, or Question Pro, which is another thing like um, Qualtrics, there's some other ones. Um, and even Amazon has their own, and it's basically people who sign up and they say that they're willing to take surveys to get some sort of benefit. It could be monetary compensation, it could be coupons. Um, so like marketing companies could give coupons if you take their surveys. Um, but so they have this pool of people who, if, if I contact Question Pro and I say, I need um, a panel of Utah residents to take my survey about people's views on climate change, um, they will have a set, set people who they can send my survey to, and they're already willing to take it, and I can offer some sort of compensation for them to take it. There's a lot of problems with doing it surveys that way, as you can imagine, right? There's going to be certain types of people who are going to be part of those panels. Also, you can think about what happens after a person 
then like takes a whole bunch of surveys, right? And they do it as sort of a way to earn money. Um, they're going to be maybe taking them quickly, assuming that they know what you're asking in a question. Um, so there, it's a it's an option, but there's problems with it. I looked into doing it last year for a just a general population survey of South Dakota, and I contacted Question Pro, which was our provider there, and they were like, "Sorry, we've only got like 15 people in the whole state that are part of our panel, so it's it's just not going to work in in certain areas either." But Oh, but I forgot to mention, they for the people who are on the panel, they have certain information from them already. So like your gender, your age. And so I can say to them, I want women that are 18 to 25. And if they have enough people, they'll ask those people to take your survey. So statistically, it's 15 people in North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's not going to work. <laughs> I just have a question. So if you're doing statistical analysis on data, are the statistical functions built in to Excel or other uh, softwares, give, will it give you different results? You need to be aware of what software you're using to do that. Yes, it, the, the short answer is yes. Um, each approach is slightly differently. The, the more mainstream ones will give you for the like set uh, statistics, I'll give you the same answer regardless. Uh, as you branch out into a little bit more complicated methods, they start to differ, especially I've seen Excel uh, have, they, they found uh, some issues with some of the ways that they were doing it. Um, so my recommendation would be to not do statistical analyses in Excel when possible. Uh, there's free point and click software like Jamovi or JASP uh, that uh, are pretty straightforward to use and they function kind of like a spreadsheet for most of it and then you just point and click and those ones are well accepted. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so that's Jamovi, J-A-M-O-V-I, it's free, uh, or JASP, J-A-S-P. Weird names for software that's how stats like to <laughs> Just an unsolicited comment from an engineering perspective. I use spreadsheets a lot, and I use them in my classes that I teach. And um, one of the things I ask my students to do is to do what I have to say. I have rows of observations, I have columns. Um, and I'll ask them to do a set of hand calculations for one row of data. It does a couple of things. It, number one, it checks my spreadsheet or my ability to do hand calculations, right? And make sure if those match up and I feel confident that my spreadsheet is, is processing the way it should be processing. But again, to future self, if I come back for me, it's like five minutes later. Like, you know, what's the spreadsheet do? I don't remember. <laughs> but if I have a set of hand calculations, in, in just a couple of minutes, I can I see all my equations, I see what it does, and now I know what my spreadsheet does. You know, so it's, it's kind of a nice tool for a particular type of analysis. If it's an analysis tool, you might come back and use again and again as a professional or something. That's something that I encourage my students to do. Is there, sometimes I, I, I pull data out of the census and I don't know how to work with like their raw files. And so I'm like, well, sometimes I use their raw files, but like there's a lot of times data cleaning when you're trying to make a rectangular file where you've got Every row is a is a observation, and every column is a uh, variable. Is that right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes, like for example, if I if I'm just extracting data, that's like for a couple of different cities or something, and then I've got a lot of dates, just for example, then like each observation, I have to I have to like hand put in the date, like to make that like a date variable, and then I have to. And then I have to copy, you know, copy and paste that date because I only have it once, and then I've got all of the, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there like a way to clean data that's that's messed up that way, like fast? I I've never been able to do it. <laughs> it's not just really important. So I, I am biased, but uh, programs like R, um, I, I generally can do things like that in in a moment. It doesn't take a whole lot of work. Where in a spreadsheet, it might take me hour or more, depending on how big the data is. And census data is, anything from the government is going to be kind of messy. <laughs> if you're lucky enough to not get it in a PDF. 
There's a, <laughs> there's a worse, but um, yeah, I, I haven't found any really good shortcuts in a spreadsheet per se. Um, it's usually in a uh, like another programming uh, type language like R. R has some uh, simplificated code. Like if you looked at it years ago, uh, it looks very different now. So it is something to look into. Um, there are classes up here that, that teach it. I teach one of those. Um, we cover how to do things like that. Because those things happen everywhere. And uh, it can be worth spending 30 hours learning something like R uh, and then never have to do that in a spreadsheet again. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's trade-offs, but yeah. That's a great question. There's also a tool called Open Refine. Has anyone here used Open Refine? And it's super, oh, it, it, it'll clean data, tabular data, and, and some simple things like that. It's, it's very intuitive, easier to learn than R. And if it's something where you just have to, like some dates that you have to get cleaned up, it'll, it'll go like that. What's the name? What part of it? Open Refine. Open source. Uh, and if you have questions about that, I can show you at some time. You can stop by and see me, and I can show you how to use that. That's cool. Just I have a question. So aside from number of samples, mm -hmm. is there a way of, how, how do you professional people in your line of research, how do you report heterogeneity or generalization or generalizability of the data? You know, you can, like you said, you make some assumptions. You could have like a thousand samples. You could say, you assume that it's generalizable, but Besides the number of responses, are there other ways to report quality of data, so to speak? Sure. Um, one thing that I do a lot, and this is why, um, if you get the census this year, take it. <laughs> um, we'll compare our data. Like if I, when I did that survey up in North Dakota, in Montana, in a couple, and these were county level samples, I could compare my respondents to the percentage of, say, like males and females that live there. And um, in that survey, for example, I found that I had a higher percentage of males responding to my survey than actually lived there in the population. And so then I weighted it accordingly. Um, yeah, comparing to other data sources is, is important. Um, I don't know, did that answer your question? Yeah, but Checking on the quality. That's, that's an important thing to report, right? Because yeah. as a reader of your research, I'd like to know something about that, right? Yeah, certainly, and increasingly, as, as we've seen these re the response rates go down, reviewers in journal articles are also looking for you to report on that, um, that testing that you've done between the respondents and the non-respondents. And so one thing that I've actually moved to that makes my life a little bit easier is getting sampling frames that have some data on all of the people in my population. Um, so, so for instance, I used to, when I was doing surveys uh, of farmers, I used to do a request to the government of people, of farmers who had participated in government programs. They'll only give you the names and addresses of farmers. If I buy my, my sampling frame from a private organization, they'll give me the names, addresses, emails, and then some characteristics of them. So like the number of acres that they have, their gross farm income from last year, and then I can, with my own data set, I can see, oh shoot, my respondents were much more higher income than the population. And so at least like making sure you know those and report on them helps people assess the quality of your data too, for sure. If there's valuable coupons, I'd all be happy to take your census surveys. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, let's thank our speakers. For